Hope that you have a great day in the Lord, and let's continue our worship as we come before our God. Well, there's some silence there, so if you want to know what you can look it up online because it'll be posted on Facebook <laughs> after the service. No, I was talking about uh, a couple who came before us during our conference, and a young lady, a, a single woman, we could only know her first name because she is going to one of those creative access countries to work uh, in rescuing women who are involved in prostitution and also in uh, uh, young girls who are part of the slave trade there. And it's a very dangerous position. And I, honestly, after she talked to us, uh, it, it really just moved me to want to give to her and for her love for that people group and for those girls. So if you want to hear more about that or want to, uh, obviously, want to hear more about that, you can... You don't need any more information than that. I was <laughs> just thinking of it. But you can always go to the Christian Missionary Alliance website, cmalliance.org. All right, we're looking at uh, cultural Christianity and versus biblical Christianity. I'm going to start saying biblical Christianity because I, I think we need to break barriers from cultural Christianity. I grew up in a cultural Christianity. You go to church, you do your time, and then the rest of the week is whatever you want to do. You just kind of put your money, a couple dollars in the plate, and, and you figure that you'll pay the professionals to do the work of God. And I grew up that way. And most of us did. And I want to break away from that. I want to break the barriers that are in my life in cultural Christianity. We looked at that. And in cultural Christianity is simply that you, you, you start to change your thinking about the truth of the gospel, and you start to change the truth of the gospel to fit what everybody thinks on the outside of the church. So if, it does, if people say, well, you shouldn't be preaching about that, all right, we won't preach about that. Oh, you shouldn't be doing that, all right, we won't do that. Uh, you should be so supporting this uh, right to do this, well, we'll support that right. And churches are changing the message of the scripture to fit their culture. A biblical Christian will not change the message. The message of the truth of God will always be the same. We may be culturally sensitive in our methods, but we're not going to change the word of God. So that's why we're the Parkside Bible Church, and that is where we are. And so we're going to be looking at one, break it away, uh, from cultural Christianity, and we talk about sharing our faith with others. I entitled this sermon, Find the Lost, because it comes from uh, Luke 15, verses 1 to 31. If you want to take out your outline, there are deeper life questions, and you know, again, uh, we are, we're going to be looking at this whole idea of talking about the lost, those who do not know Jesus Christ, and to how to find them. I don't know about you, but... Um, Getting directions can still be confusing, even with cars that give you audible directions. Has anybody found that out? Uh, yes, and, and, and take a right here, take a left there, and I'm going, no, I don't want to go that way. And I keep saying to my car, can't you learn the way I want to go? That's what I keep saying to my car. And then it says back to me, you know, you're talking too loud. Did you ever get that message? I'm the only one that gets that message? My goodness. Talking cars, that's what we need. Some people say that one of the miracles of the Christmas story was that the three wise men actually stopped to get directions. Do you remember that? That was the miracle of Christmas. Now, I, I was said that in a public uh, venue one time, and a woman said, yes, because they were wise men. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, I don't know if you heard of a movie called Uncharted. It's a recent movie, an adaptation of a PlayStation game. You know, these movies that do so well when they are adaptations of um, video games. Well, in the movie, Tom Holland, by the way, Tom Holland, you know, he's a British actor. In every movie that I have seen him in, he has not spoken in a word of British. I don't know. I don't know why, but it's a, Anyway, he is told in the movie Uncharted, he's told by his brother the simple but a profound statement. He's told, his brother says, if something is lost, it can be found. 
And what we're saying is, if it's not destroyed and, it's, and it, it hasn't been you know, melted down, if it's just lost, it can be found. And I thought of that statement <laughs> right in the, in the middle of the movie. And uh, I thought, if someone is lost and they're still breathing, they can be found. And I think we need to grab hold of that. I, I think we as a, as a people group called the Church of Jesus Christ, we need to realize there are people that are lost in our world, that are neighbors, our friends, that are our family members, that could be even sitting in our church and they don't know about Jesus. We need to find them. In December 7th, 1988, Armenia had an earthquake where 30,000 people died in four minutes. An estimated 50,000 were dead by the end of the week. Armenian businesses were demolished, dream homes were reduced to splinters, and beautiful parks were filled with rubble. The father of 10-year-old Armad could not drive to his son's school because the streets had literally disappeared. He finally got to the school and he climbed upon the debris that he believed was his son's classroom and started digging with his bare hands. I'm going to continue that story throughout this message. Have you ever been used by God to find someone? Have you ever been used by God to find someone? Maybe it was a child that was lost in the mall. By the way, we, we lost our child once or twice in the mall, I think. And you hear over the loudspeaker, will the parents of Brandon Gerhardt please come to the information center? That is crazy when you, that happens. That's the problem of having three kids. You think Janet has the other one. I had the one, Janet has the two, and she's thinking, I have the one and Mike has the two. And the third one gets lost. Well, God wants to find people, and he wants to use you to find them. One who is spiritually lost in the rubble of dead-end dreams. I, I was thinking of this, I, I imagine, can you imagine Gabriel and Michael are up there with God, and God's up there and says, listen, I got something for, to show you. Mike Gerhardt just got on a plane, and he's sitting next to a guy who just got broken from a, a relationship that he poured all of his life into, and now he's sitting next to Mike, and he's just, all of his dreams are broken, and he's not a Christian, but Mike, I prepared Mike just for this moment. Let's watch, watch the scene. And there I am, sitting next to this guy. God has prepared him. And, and matter of fact, God says to Michael and Gabriel, hey, get the party hats and the confetti. We're gonna be celebrating when this guy comes to Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And I go, oh, I am so tired. And I sleep through the entire flight. And I miss the opportunity to talk to this guy who needs Jesus. Now you're probably saying, you know, Pastor Mike, I don't, I don't really have opportunities to talk to people about Jesus. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I work every day. I got softball practice. And, I, you know, I'm, I'm working with my kids at school. And I don't have time. I don't have opportunities. Well, you may have missed a chance, just like I missed that chance on that plane. Because someone will come to you on Monday, and they'll ask you this question. What did you do this weekend? How many have never been asked that question? Don't raise your hand. You've never been asked, hey, what'd you do this weekend? I got asked that all the time. I went to church and worshiped Jesus as my Lord and Savior. How about, how about just a question? When a coworker shares a crisis in their life and you're listening to them and you're thinking, boy, how long is this person gonna go on? You know, I gotta get back to my job. Instead, why don't you say, can I pray for you right now? How about the opportunity when, when a family member notices how you've changed since getting religious, and you say, well, let me tell you, I didn't get religious, I found Jesus as my Savior and Lord. We say we don't have opportunities, 
But there are many, many opportunities out there. But cultural Christianity says, oh, wait a second. Religion is a private affair. No, don't say anything. You might hurt somebody's feelings. You don't want to tell somebody they're lost. I mean, that's so rude. I mean, we, cultural Christianity says, you know, it really doesn't matter. All roads lead to heaven. It doesn't matter if you're a Christian or a Buddhist or whatever. Don't, don't be evangelizing or proselytizing. That's a bad thing. So let's just keep our Christianity to ourselves. That's cultural Christianity. Is that biblical Christianity? I hope you're thinking no, because it isn't. That's not biblical Christianity. You know, Jesus spoke to uh, many different people, and actually in this passage, the Pharisees are watching him because they know that he has spoken to tax collectors, and worse, he has spoken to prostitutes, and he's t spoken to evil people, and they're watching him and what he says. You know, by the way, when I say that, you probably say, tax collectors? What's so bad about a tax collector? Well, let me just clue you in. It would have been the same statement if I were to say Jesus spoke to child molesters, rapists, and wife beaters. Now do you get the picture? Jesus actually dined with them, had a meal with them, invited them in, loved them, and spoke the truth to them about their life. Think about that for a moment. Most of us are disgusted with that kind of people, and we won't even talk to people like that people for whom Jesus died. The religious right of that day, the Pharisees were thoroughly disgusted with those people and would not even bother to look at them. But Jesus would. He spoke three parables in Luke 15 that we're gonna look at very quickly, and I know it's gonna go quick. But I wanna look at these three parables. So the first one is in Luke 15, verses four to seven, I'll put up on the screen. Jesus says to the crowds, suppose one of you had 100 sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you the truth, and in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Now be careful with that last statement, who do not think they need to repent. How many righteous people are on the planet right now? Righteousness, by their own righteousness, they've gained perfect life, they are holy, they are holier than everybody else. How many people on the planet, what do you say? Zero. Zero people. The Bible says there are none righteous, no, not one. So this is actually a statement of Jesus trying to get at the people who think they're righteous. Oh, those who think they're righteous, they do not need to repent. Ha, ha. By the way, kind of jokes that Jesus taught. <laughs> By the way, Jesus did say some funny things. We're not funny to all people. Do you ever have those jokes where you kind of make a joke, but there's one person that takes offense to it? Guess what? The Pharisees were listening, and they absolutely took offense to his jokes. Now, people say, well, Pastor Mike, you shouldn't say Jesus. Jesus never joked. Uh, come and see me. I'll show you at least five places where he is really funny. Okay? Just to let you know. I might have a warped sense of humor, though, but that might be, that might be true, too. Now, there's a similar parable in... Uh, uh, Matthew 18. Now, my point is that lost sheep need a searching shepherd. In Matthew 18, there's a sheep that wandered off from the others. And, they, and Matthew uses the word wander. And in the context of Matthew 18, it, the whole context of Matthew 18 is the church of Jesus Christ. It even says if someone who's a brother sins against you, you need to go to them, etc. So there is this uh, difference between the word that is used in Matthew 18 and the word that is used here, lost is different than wayward, okay? A lost person is someone who does not know Jesus, who does not have salvation. A wayward Christian is someone who knows Jesus, and may have gone to church for a long time, but then has wandered from the group 
and the shepherd needs to go after that one also. So just to make the difference, lost is different than wayward. God has sheep that still need to be found. God has sheep that need to be found. And God's found people, you and I, who know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, not just the pastors, who, by the way, are called shepherds, which is really interesting to say the least, but we all need to take this as a responsibility of our own. And I believe that we will when we understand biblical Christianity as opposed to cultural Christianity, when we break away from the cultural Christianity that we grew up with. So, like beggars, by the way, who have found the bread of life, we show others where to look for the bread. The shepherds search with diligence and passion. By the way, I, I want to put this up here. Sharing our faith is not a special gift. Some people will tell me, oh, Pastor Mike, I don't, I don't have the gift of evangelism. Uh, evangelism. I don't have the gift of evangelism. Let me tell you, let me clue you in. I don't have the gift of evangelism. I don't. I tried it. I went out there with tracks and passing out tracks, and, and I'd say, you know, maybe you want to read this, you know, and people would take it, and then i go, you know, just, you know, let me know if you read it. I was, I'm, not, I'm not an evangelist. You know, I would talk to people in my office, and I'd say, here, think about it. I told that to an evangelistic pastor, and he said, I would have never let them out of my office. They wouldn't have gone out of the office until they trusted Christ. I said, well, I don't have the gift of evangelism. I have to serve God's people, and I have to be an evangelist. Matter of fact, it even says, Timothy says, uh, Paul said to Timothy, be an evangelist. And I'm sure Timothy was saying, I'm not one of those, but be it anyway. Because sharing your faith, God can use your story so that someone else can come to Jesus. And if you want to call that evangelism, you want to call that uh, being an evangelist, whatever. But all we are called to do is to be God's witnesses. That's what we're called to do. And that includes all of us, correct? We're all to be up on the witness stand and, and tell people our story. As we look at this, it is a great blessing, by the way, to tell our story. Especially when one is found. When you've shared your story, and I've done this many times, and the person comes back and says, can, you, can I make an appointment with you just to talk to you about this stuff? And I go, sure. And we talk, and we talk, and we talk, maybe four or five sessions. They finally say, how do I become a Christian? Tell them how it happened to you. And then pray with them. Bring them to church. When it happens, when it happens, you will come to church with your friend whom you led to Jesus, and you will have the biggest smile of anybody. I'll recognize, oh, that person just led that person to Christ. I will recognize that. Because when that happens, your heart is so filled with joy that you rescued someone who is perishing, and they now are found. I know that feeling. Matter of fact, I know many of you who know that feeling because you've brought people here that you've shared your story with and they have trusted Christ. Let's go to the next parable, okay? Uh, but before we do, I want to talk about Ar Armand's dad. Armand's dad stood on the pile of rocks and one rock at a time he began to dig. He kept on thinking, I must find my son. I must find my son. I must find my son. Let's read verses 8 through 10 in Luke 15. Or suppose a woman who has 10 silver coins loses one. She does, not, does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me. I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm about to tell you this. You know, when I lose a coin like a penny or a nickel or a dime, I am not sweeping the house for that dime or nickel, all right? 
Okay, so let's, let's, let's make sure we understand what this coin is all about. And we're, we're talking about lost coins need a, a careful looker. These coins, these 10 coins, may have been her life savings. Yes, we're talking big money. One of those coins, which is, by the way, the Greek drachma, was a day's wages. So think of two weeks' pay. Now you're going to be sweeping your house for one of those, right, a day's wages? Yeah, I would be. The coins, one coin was lost. Notice what it says. She searched diligently. Uh, she searched many different ways. Uh, she swept the house, lit, uh, lit a lamp. She continued to search until she found the coin. I always like to say that. You know, somebody um, you know, loses something and, and you keep looking, you keep looking, and the person comes up and they say, you know what? I found it. It was in the last place I looked. No kidding. It was in the last place you looked because why would you keep looking for it? Do you, do you ever say that to somebody? Yeah, you just have to slap them for me, all right? That's the last place. She, did, she started looking when she found it. I want to say it was very valuable to her. We have a saying here in the Christian Missionary Alliance that lost people matter to God. The lost people of the world, they matter to God. Do they matter to us? Are they valuable to us? There was great value in that coin. And each human being, there's great value. So much that Jesus was dying for each person. You can actually tell somebody that they are worth dying for because Jesus died for them. That's valuable. <sighs> you know, Jesus didn't uh, come to die for you because you're better than everyone else. But we must understand that we are valued. So do you value a person even though they favor the opposite political party? Uh, do you value uh, every person or if they make more money than you or they're your boss or they're, they have a kid on the rival team that's playing better than your son or daughter? Do you still value everyone? Are you just as passionate to share your story with a homeless person as you are with your best friend? God doesn't make distinctions. I was not a Christian. I was a lascivious young man. I could care less about church. There was one girl that I, I liked at church, and so that's why I went to church. But God loved me, and he died for me. I was unworthy of his love. God doesn't make distinctions. 24 hours had passed. Armand's relentless father did not give up looking through the rubble. His hands were now bleeding. His heart was racing. His back was breaking, but he would not stop until he found his son. In Jesus' third parable, it's about a son who, uh, <laughs> did I do this right? It's, it's about a lost son who needs a watching father. Let me tell you, uh, I'm not going to read all the verses, but please open up your Bibles. I'm going to read the first couple of verses, um, verse 11 and 12. Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, give me my share of the estate. So the man, father divided up his estate, gave this young man a big chunk of money. He went to another country, spent all the money on prostitution and wild living, and he spent it all, and he was desolate after a, just a few months, and he started to work for a pig farmer, and his wages were how many 
corn cob he could eat that was being fed to the pigs. And while he was sitting in that pig pen, he started thinking about his father, his rich father. And he got a plan. He was going to go back to his father. He says, I'm no longer worthy. He was going to practice this sermon or message. <laughs> I'm no longer worthy of your son. I just make me one of your servants. And he started back. Let's pick it up in verse 20. So the son got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, the Bible says, a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, kissed him. The son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be your son. But the father said to him, Quick, bring the best robe, put it on him. Put a, finger on his, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead, is alive again. He was lost and is found. Someone who's lost can still be found, right? Even a wayward son. Someone who's lost can still be found. The end of that passage in uh, verses 31 and 32, the, uh, the older son who stayed with his father and worked on the farm and got really upset with the party that was going on for the return of the younger son and argues with the father, how come you never killed the calf for me? The father says to that son, verse 31, my son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive and he says it again, he was lost, but now is found. Do you think it's important to, to, to say that twice in this passage? He was lost and now is found. He's lost and now is found. You see how important it is that the lost people of the world need to be found? I think it was on the Lord's heart. The character is the rebellious father, the forgiving father, excuse me, the rebellious son, the forgiving father, and the angry brother. I have questions about this, you know. I always have these questions. Why did the father give the son the money? Wasn't that stupid to do? I mean, don't you feel that way? Who would give that up? It's just a parable. Remember, it's a story. A parable is a story. I don't think this happened. You know, how long was the kid gone for? You know, we have some uh, questions. I have questions anyway. Uh, how long was the father watching for his son? While he was oh, far off, did, did he finally just get a glance of his son, or was he always watching on the horizon for his son? You probably heard of sermons on this. I'm not going to give you a sermon on this, but uh, I actually am giving a sermon on this. But my emphasis is here, when the son was a long way off. The question is, do you have a son or a daughter who's a long way off? Do you have a husband or a wife that's a long way off? Do you have a friend? our colleague that is a long way off. And let me ask you, are you patient with that someone? Are you patient? I brought this up last uh, week, I believe. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 3 and 9, it says, God is patient with us. You know, God is patient with us. You know what I'm saying? He's patient with us because he doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Who's the us right there? Who, who represents the U.S. there? Us. Peter is writing to the church of Jesus Christ, and he's saying God is patient with Mike Gerhardt because he doesn't want anybody out there or in here to be lost. God's patient with me, waiting for me to open my mouth and share my story. He's patient with us. He's patient with you, too. 
He's waiting for you to tell your story. See, God will not lay on his own horn. By the way, I, had, oh, I wanted to have a story there. Yeah, do you ever come to a, <laughs> do you ever come to a stoplight and there's a right on red and in front of you the traffic is just going crazy and there's somebody behind you wanting to do the right on, wanting you to do the right on red and is blowing his horn. Come on, come on, just jump in. Yeah, come on, come on. That's what the horn sounds like to me. Come on, just jump in. Come on, come on. I don't feel like crashing, you know, there's traffic. He doesn't see the traffic. I'm looking in my mirror and going, what? I can see the right on red. Yeah, I know, I know the law of the state. Back off on your horn, right? God will not lay on his horn. He won't picket your house. He won't send you email reminders. But you may experience the consequences of not sharing your faith. What are those consequences? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about the judgment seat of Christ. At the judgment seat of Christ, our works for the Lord will be judged. They will be tested with fire. The times that you had, the opportunities that you had to speak about your faith, they will be tested with fire. We're not talking about sins, by the way. Everybody thinks, I'm going to see a videotape of every sin I ever did. No, that's not the judgment seat of Christ. It's all about what you did for the kingdom of God. And as a matter of fact, it's going to be a time of rewards for those of us who spoke up, for those of us who said something. There's going to be rewards for those who worked for the kingdom of God. And by the way, that's all of us. We're all working for the kingdom of God. But you may have other consequences. God is patient with us, not wanting any to perish. Armad's father worked for 38 hours straight, pulling boulder after boulder until he heard the faint cry of a child's weak voice. It was his son. Papa, you found me. People matter to God. If you have been found, someone was looking for you and shared with you the truth of the gospel. Someone invited you to a crusade. Someone invited you to a church. Or maybe you walked in a church and someone sat with you. Maybe you were invited to a life group and someone told you about Jesus. Someone was looking for you to find you for Christ. They need to hear and we need to tell. They need to know our story. They need to feel that you care for them as a person and they're not just a, a checklist that Pastor Mike said, you gotta go and talk to somebody about Jesus this week. Check it off your list. No. No. Do it because you love them. I want you to consider, each one of you, I want you to consider coming forward tonight, today. I know, I know the sermon's long, I'm sorry. But coming forward to talk to God about how you should share your story with someone this year, this month. Let's pray. Would you stand with me as we pray? And Father, you found me and rescued me from the ravages of sin and death. Even now, Father, I sometimes lose my way and I need someone to show me directions. Even now, I become wayward and I need someone to pull me back onto the path and into the fold. And Father, I, I don't want to be a cultural Christian. I want to break that barrier in my life. I want to be able to share my story freely whenever I can with every opportunity with great love and understanding for the person as they listen to my story. I want to be there for them 
And if it takes months and years for me to be with them, to lead them to the cross, may I do that. Father, I pray for anyone here who wants to break the barrier in their life, who wants to break that bad thought that I, I, I'm not an evangelist, I can't share my story, or it's not politically correct to share my story, or I don't want to be proselytizing. Father God, whatever it is that is holding them back from being a biblical Christian, I pray, Lord, that they would come before you and ask you to break that barrier. Father, there's probably someone here, Lord, who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. They are lost. May they know that you are a searching Father, that you did a great work on that cross of Jesus to pay for their sins, that by trusting in Jesus, their sins can be forgiven. By repenting of their sins and being filled by the Holy Spirit, they become a new person with a new pur purpose. So, Father, for anyone who comes forward during this song, I pray that they would meet with you and make it right with you. And we pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's people said, amen. Come forward during this song, and we'll meet you up front. If you want prayer, just raise your hand, and we'll come and pray with you, okay?
Amen. Amen. Jesus is our anthem. He brings us freedom. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> sorry, he brings freedom to people who hear our story if they trust Christ. Let's, let's, let's spread the good news, huh? Let's, let's do that. I appreciate you all staying here during this whole sermon because I know I got long. God bless you. Have a great day in the Lord.